hello everyone. Super excited for this next panel. Um, I know a lot of people in the audience are developers, so this panel will be for you. Um, and today we have uh, three three panelists, and um, Ivy is going to be our um, host to kind of ask questions. So Ivy, she's an AI consultant at Studio Zolo. Uh, Lawrence, he is director of production engineering at Shopify. Lisa is the engineering manager at Zapier, and Anhuan is a engineering coach at Help Scout. Okay, so I'll give it to Ivy Lee to take it away. Thanks, Debbie. Um, let's start with some warm up questions. Um, for each of you, um, what attracted to your respective companies? Um, sure, Lawrence, I guess I'll. First? Oh, go, oh, yeah, Lawrence, go ahead. Well, I guess I'll, I'll go. Oh, no, you uh, can take it, anyone. <laughs> first, I'm really excited to be with all of you uh, today and hoping that we can really give you some tips uh, in getting the job that you've always dreamed of. What attracted me to Help Scout actually was the job description. Help Scout really created these well-crafted, very intentional job descriptions or JDs that describe the role, it describe who you'll be working with. And I really like the fact that a lot of the response to the JD were essay questions, right? And now that I'm on the other side and I actually am involved in hiring, we take those responses very, very seriously. And so the JD at Help Scout, <clears throat> excuse me, really helped me see that the company is very thoughtful and very intentional. Uh, and that has really informed my entire experience here. Okay, so I'll, I'll jump in now. Um, so I, I really like this question as a start is it's one of those things where when you're looking for a new job, you should really like ideally be really excited about the place where you're going. And so for me, Shopify was, um, it really filled a couple of uh, key uh, needs that I, that I had in any new employer. And that was, I wanted to go a place where I could really learn and a place where I could grow. And I really believe that I got the opportunity to do that at Shopify. Uh, I think Shopify is one of these places where you get a lot Lawrence, are you a lot there? of the startup feel without a lot of this. Yeah. yeah uh, so know. Shopify, I was saying Shopify gets, um, Shopify is a lot like a startup in many ways, especially with the attitude that we take on the work that we're doing. Um, but you get a lot of the startup benefits without the startup risk. And so for me, uh, as like a provider for my family as well, that was really important uh, as well. But I got to get those, again, growth and learning um, in this startup environment. But it, um, again, it's a bigger company from that perspective too. Lisa, how about you? So um, kind of a, a combination of both of those, um, what my previous um, companions here have said, um, Zapier has always been 100% remote. So everything we do is very intentional. And that intentionality shows. Um, also, we have a very clear set of company values that are reflected in everything we do. And I don't think I realized how important that was until I joined Zapier. Um, it's very nice. I knew them before I started and they permeate everything we do and that's still consistent now. So that combined with the same sort of application process that Anwan described where it's essay questions rather than just a, a, a parsed resume um, in order to find out a little bit more about what who you are. Um, and then the interview process itself um, was also a thing for me. I spent as much time getting to know Zapier as they got to know me and that was, I felt very equitable and I think we both learned from that experience that we were going to be a good match. Great. Um, how big is the team each of you manage and what are your main responsibilities? Sure, I guess we'll continue this order. Uh, at Help Scout, we have a player coach model. So as an engineering coach, I manage a team of five people uh, that includes two JavaScript developers who take care of our front end work, two PHP developers who do a lot of our middle world uh, work and some back end work, and one QA person. Uh, as the coach, I'm responsible for helping my uh, players feel supported and that they have a very clear view of what the career at Help Scout uh, should look like and that beyond the work that we're obviously responsible for doing and shipping features to customers, uh, features that we hope that our customers love, uh, I always want to make sure that we have a clear sense of what are the goals of my players and, and in what way can I interweave the needs of the business with the personal goals of my players. I'm also responsible for managing projects and so I'm involved in planning, execution and monitoring uh, and then closing those projects out. 
Lawrence? Sure. So uh, my current team is 78 people. Um, I run a team known as Developer Acceleration. So our mission at the company is to make commerce developers highly productive. And you can think of us as the team that's here to scale engineering. So engineering at Shopify uh, started as a smaller team. It's now over 1,000 people. And the challenges that you face when you scale to 1,000 people are sort of big challenges, even things that seem like small ones. So the, the obvious one or the first one that I usually bring up is when I'm onboarding in a company, if there's a handful of developers at the company and it takes me you know, a couple of days or a week to onboard, that's okay, that's a week loss. But when I'm onboarding 20 developers every two weeks, you have to multiply that out for the amount of lost time. And so that's something where it's worth the investment. So my team handles uh, all of the tooling and practices, processes, uh, libraries, and languages uh, work that we do at Shopify. Uh, we do shared context as well. So. Concretely, this is things like our open, open source contributions to Ruby and Rails, uh, the way that we do uh, our local development tooling, our continuous integration and continuous deployment, as well as interacting with production infrastructure, but also how we share context through our developer handbook uh, and things like Dev Talks or our, our annual Dev Summit. Um, so my responsibility is, as any manager, it's uh, for uh, strategy execution and team composition. So hiring, building, making sure the teams are working well, but it's also the strategy at the engineering level. And so I think this is one of those differences once you get to the director level, certainly at Shopify, you're looking sort of up and out as well. And so what's the health of Shopify engineering? What are the cross product line uh, issues that we face and how do we build engineering as a discipline within the company and work with the other disciplines effectively? So it's really a broad reaching role that has like a narrow scope of responsibility. Cool. Lisa, how about your team at Zapier? So I um, I manage six engineers. Uh, my team has the widest global reach of any at Zapier. I have two engineers in Taiwan, one in Australia, one in Portugal, one in Birmingham, UK, uh, two in California. And, um, and then I work with a product manager and a designer as an EPD trio. Um, and all engineering teams at Zapier run that way so that we have input, uh, cross-discipline input. My team is developer platform and we're in charge of the um, mechanism that both our internal teams and any external developer that wants to build an app on Zapier uses. We have a command line interface and a graphic interface so you can come and build whatever app you'd like using our tools. Um, we are now engaged in a project to extract uh, each individual service out of the monolith as many folks are engaged in doing now. And so uh, my team is the first, we're leading the way and um, we're setting up um, the primitives that most other teams are gonna use uh, in their journey. So the developer platform came out first and we're halfway or so on that project. Um, and I have three backend engineers, three front end engineers, and um, they're just, they're wonderful humans. I'm responsible for their success and continued happiness uh, as they work at Zapier. My job is part coach and part mentor and part, you know, person who helps you get your personnel stuff done. Um, so I try to take care of them. Uh, my goal is for them to be their best selves at Zapier. And so I go to meetings so they don't have to. And I represent developer platform throughout the company and I work with um, other engineering managers. We've set up a bunch of peer um, groups as managers that we work together and solve problems and also help each other out. Um, peer management is crucial for me. Um, I'm a relatively new manager, I'm not brand new, but it helps um, having other managers' perspectives on things. When you're a 100% remote company, it can be kind of isolating as an individual contributor. It's even more isolating as a manager. So having that um, support has been crucial for me. And I sort of seek that out. I, I started the manager circles um, at the company because selfishly I, I wanted to talk to other managers. So that's what I do. Cool. Um, Lisa, if you don't mind uh, continuing with the next question, sure. um, which is, can you describe your team's engineering interview process and do you feel there's a big difference when the candidate is remote? So um, I'm going to say 100% no, because we hire and, and um, interview very successfully and have from the very beginning 100% remote. Um, our interview process has, um, so the initial phase is obviously that essay questions and the answers to those questions are reviewed. Um, if you're selected to um, participate in the, the process further, there is a take home uh, code assignment that you can work on at your own pace um, and use any resources you wish. 
Um, and after that is evaluated, then there's uh, a few in-person interviews, depending on the level or the job that you're after, that you might meet with um, the team that you're on or a team across um, engineering department team made up of engineers from various other teams. Um, and it's uh, questions, once you've done the technical exercise, there's not gonna be any um, like live coding aspects to the interview. You will have already achieved that and been approved for that part of it. So you don't have to whiteboard or answer any, you know, um, coding problems in your head while we're working together. Um, and there's no pair programming part of it as, as well. So there'll be some technical thought questions. How would you work through this problem? But no, like, can you write code on a whiteboard for us situation? Um, and and then there's uh, you'll meet with both people from engineering, but also people from um, outside the department so that you can um, get to know different parts of Zapier while you're going through the interview process. Cool. And Juan, do you want to follow up? Absolutely. So very similar to what Lisa just described. Um, after our people operations or our POPs, a uh, team goes through the resumes and decides the candidates that meet what we're looking for. Uh, we have what we call a value add interview. And so a as a coach, uh, I'm usually doing this part of the process and that is not culture fit, right? Because we find that culture is often social and culturally constructed in unhelpful ways. Uh, but we have what we call a value add, meaning what does this person have beyond the base skill set? Uh, but what perspectives, what specialized skill sets do they have uh, that will really add to Health Scout? And so uh, that interview is roughly 45 minutes. Uh, then we have a standard tech screen, which is also about 45 minutes, where a member of our, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, dev team talks to the candidate, I guess, a sense of uh, their technical acumen, uh, and then make sure that from that perspective that we're all clear. Uh, we have a brief call to go over, okay, is this candidate feeling good about the process, what's their timeline? Uh, and then we move on to the project. And so uh, again, similar to what Lisa described, we do have a take home project uh, that this person works on. Uh, we do compensate people who get this far for their time because we know that doing this work is labor uh, and that not everyone has the privilege to do this freely. And so we try to cover some of that cost uh, by paying them for uh, what they do with the project. Uh, the timeline we're very, based on what the project is. Uh, but uh, once they turn in that project, uh, our internal team will go over the project, look at it, uh, get a sense of what this candidate did. We'll, we'll pull other candidates who were hired and look at their projects. Uh, and then after that, uh, if all goes well, we get to the final interview uh, where pe members of the hiring team talk to the candidate. Uh, this time, hopefully they're feeling good about us. We're feeling good with regards to them and we try to get to a hiring decision. Uh, once we decide that this person uh, is a good fit, uh, we check their references. We typically want three people to provide a reference. Uh, ideally two uh, would be previous managers uh, from this candidate. Uh, we have a final huddle, uh, and then the hiring manager makes the final call uh, before we extend the offer and hopefully celebrate someone uh, joining Help Scout. Uh, we currently do not do pair programming as part of our process, but that is something that I've uh, just been kicking around in my head about something that might be really helpful. So that's how we hire at Help Scout. Lawrence, how about Shopify? Yeah, at Shopify, we have a structured process, um, much like what you just heard. So we will generally, you'll start with a conversation with uh, the hiring manager, someone in a position like mine uh, or a recruiter. And this is really a conversation where we can share a bit about Shopify with you and you can share a bit with us. And it's really trying to figure out whether there's a match and whether we think that there's a, a reason to go forward in the process because this is gonna be a good outcome. And again, that's on both sides. That's you evaluating us and us evaluating you at the beginning. Um, after that, we have a couple of interviews that we typically conduct. So we have a coding challenge uh, that you can complete uh, on your own time, I believe. And then um, we have another one called a life story. And the life story is really to get a sense of who you are as a person, what are the decisions that you've made, what drives you. So it's a little different than the rest of the interviews that we go through the process. After that, we get into some more structured interviews that are really focused on you and your technical background. So we have a technical deep dive where we wanna take a project or sometimes two projects that you've worked on and really dive deep on the implementation details, understand what you did, why did you make those decisions? What was the outcome? What did you learn from doing this, right? So a little self-reflection on that. 
Um, and then we have two, one which is a pair programming where you're working with someone else. You can think about it if you've done pair programming, you're the one at the keyboard driving and you've got the interview, interviewer along with you as another brain that can work with you on the problem. And then similarly, we've got a problem solving interview where the two of you work together to solve a problem and we have a problem set for you. And we have a number of those different types of problems we work through. After that, it's pretty standard, uh, like you heard as well. So going through reference checks and uh, working with recruiting on it. Um, but that's the general process that you can expect to go through with most of our interviews. Uh, we don't have a take home project, actually. That's one where uh, I did hear that. So that's one where I know some companies do. We don't have a take home project. Got it. Um, in terms of preparing for technical interviews, um, are there any resources to review or tools to be familiar with or things you would recommend candidates do before their interview? Well, I know at Help Scout, right, being familiar with our stack, right? So we have React front ends, we use uh, Java in the back end and PHP basically in the middle. So obviously knowing uh, th those frameworks and that stack is helpful. Um, knowing, and I would say go to the Help Scout webpage and read where we talk about who we are and our team and how we're constructed. And you'll find, I think that we have a very uh, diverse team with diverse perspectives. And I think that that would be great to uh, look at and then just why Help Scout? Um, we build software for people who care about their customers. And so uh, that uh, why Help Scout page will tell you really about why our software exists and really why the company was built. Uh, and, 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 and I would say that, you know, coming with more than just that technical knowledge, but that you understand our mission, you understand our, our values, uh, that is incredibly helpful uh, to understand before you come in to interview with us. Yeah, if I can if I can riff on that, I think the biggest piece of advice I would give is what you you were just saying at the end there on, on one. It's really coming in prepared for yourself. I think a lot of people misunderstand that an interview process is a company interviewing you to make sure that you can be hired by the company. This is actually it's it's a two way process, and you're interviewing the company at the same time. And so the more prep you do in advance, uh, just like we try to do some prep to understand, you know, a bit about your background, you'll send us a resume or a cover letter, other information, right? You might send us a GitHub profile or a LinkedIn or something else. The same thing, you know, what, what can you tell about the company? What is it that you want to know? And having that bit more information on your side allows you to ask questions that are a little more in depth and allows you to tailor your answers and quite honestly, uh, put on a better a better uh, display for the interviewer as well as you can, you really have a more of a sense of the direction in which uh, the interviewer wants to see you go uh, to be aligned with the company. Um, so I'll I'll piggyback on that too. Um, knowing yourself is important. Knowing the things that you like working on so that you can answer enthusiastically. If you're going to give me a link to your repos, I want to know what's in there. I'm not going to go poke through it myself. Tell me a story about what you've worked on and what you learned from it, why you made the decisions you did. Don't just give me a link, um, contextless link that doesn't give me anything about you. I want to hear about um, your journey to where you are now. What are the experiences? You take something from every job you've ever had, even if it's, I never want to do this thing again. But what are the things that you're bringing with you to this interview that um, are exciting? Um, we're hiring also for culture ad. We want to make sure that um, you are um, ex as excited to work at Zapier as we all are. So knowing something about the company is crucial, but go and build a Zap. It's super easy. That's the whole point. So go and do one so that you have some foundation for it and you can feel like both what the product is from a user perspective, as well as our aims and our values and why we provide those. Um, when you interview remotely, are there any particular tools or software you use and why did you choose them? You know, similar to, to Zapier, Help Scout was built from the ground up to be a remote company, and we've been remote for going on eight years. And so uh, we heavily use Zoom uh, for uh, just really every day um, working with the people who work at Help Scout, whether they're uh, in the same state as we are in a different country. And so really just being able to use our, our tool set, we do interviews using, uh, we do our um yeah, we use Zoom to interview candidates. And, you know, you can kind of tell someone's comfortable with Zoom and just how they present themselves. Do they seem confident? Do they maintain eye contact? Uh, do they have a stable connection? And, and just do they seem like 
they would very much make an easy transition uh, to working remotely. So I would just say Zoom, which is what we use to communicate face-to-face uh, -face, uh, every day and just be able to just use that competently uh, just gives me a sense that this candidate can at least meet the, the bare minimum for working like we work. Yeah, I'd say the same thing, except we use Google Meet instead of Zoom. But uh, otherwise, you know, our, our intention with the interviews is really to have you show off the best version of yourself. And so we do not prescribe which tools you use. If you use an IDE or you work on the command line, we don't even tell you what, what language you should be using for our coding interviews. You tell us what you're going to use. You bring your own environment configured in the way that you like to work and you're familiar working, and then we'll go from there. Um, yeah, so for us, it's 100% Zoom as well. Um, having um, a good connection, decent lighting, headphones with a microphone on them, um, and you know, a, f a, a fun virtual background will always score you points. So lean into the tools. Cool. Um, how do you test remote candidates for teamwork and communication skills? Mm. Yeah, for, for uh, at least when I'm involved in, in screening candidates for Help Scout, a lot of that is just how we, uh, how, how, how I tease out their experience in the questions, right? And so I asked them, you know, tell me a time when you disagreed with a colleague and you were wrong and they were right. And how did that go? And just that gives me a load of information about how they, you know, hopefully don't bring any ego to work. They can have discussions based on facts, not feelings. They can, they're willing to say I was wrong. Uh, and, 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 and what did they learn from that? And so really I asked a lot of questions to tease out how have they worked with others before? Uh, and then in how they communicate that experience and what they learn tells me about how they share information. Lisa or Lawrence. So we have, um, a, like I said before, a core set of um, values that are very important to us. So we typically ask questions around that and our values are default to transparency. So how do you communicate with others and how, like, when do you surface problems and how do you resolve those sorts of issues? Um, default to action, which doesn't necessarily mean run off and do the thing immediately. But, you know, if the, if, if the change that you're thinking about only affects you, go ahead and do it. If it's going to affect 100 people, maybe talk it out first, but like, go ahead and, and own that. Um, our another value is um, empathy without ego. So how do you relate to other people? How do you accept and deliver um, critical feedback? Um, and we, we have a lot of um, energy around uh, growth through feedback. So how do you engage with other humans and giving them feedback to help them grow? And how do you accept that? So we ask questions around that. And also, um, you know, some of the, the questions are very similar to what Anwan said, like um, in a situation where you had a conflict with a coworker, um, how would you resolve it? Would you let it slide? Would you you know, take it up a level? Would you work it out with them? How do you react to that type of situation? Just to hear how people interact in it in a human fashion. And because we are very intentional about our um, our team building, we have mechanisms for once folks are hired, because we know not everyone has worked remotely before. That's a benefit, that's a positive if you have, but not everybody has. So we have lots of really great onboarding for how do you get involved with your team? And then we have lots of fun stuff where we get people involved, like zappy hours and lots of uh, fun Slack channels where you can share your interests. So we typically tell people about those things in advance so that they can get ready for them. Cool, Lauren? Yeah, that, sound, that sounds great. Uh, I think if you, if you look at the interview styles that I was sharing previously, there's kind of two buckets that they fall into. One is tell us about yourself, your past experience. Let me learn who you are through the experiences that you've already had. And then the other bucket is let's work together, right? Let's work together on a pair programming. Let's work together on a problem solving where we get two people in a room, you being one and the interviewing interviewer being the other, and you actually work together to solve something. And so that's giving us a signal in terms of how do you interact? Um, how are you asking questions or how are you guiding the, the discussion? Do you take the guidance from the other person who's there? Um, these, these types of things, right? So how are you interacting with the other person? And just to get a sense of how easy that flow was um, or whether there's any kind of red flags we pull out of that. Yeah. 
Um, in the interview process, what's your favorite interview question to ask and why? So my, my favorite interview question is very much geared toward being kind of positive because I do want to, and I usually ask this last, and I ask, uh, if things go well and we extend an offer to you and you reject it, what, what would be your prediction for why? Right. Mm -hmm. And so um, I'm, I like that question uh, because one, most candidates don't expect it. So I'm, I'm giving them an opportunity to show me that they can think on their feet. Uh, but also I'm looking for answers like, you know, Help Scout has these values. And if during this process, I realize that the company that I see on the website is not the company that I'm talking to, then that's not going to be a great fit for me, right? That, that's a great answer because we do believe in our values and we try to make sure they come through in our process. Uh, a not so great answer is you don't offer me enough money, right? That would be a not so great answer, uh, maybe an honest answer, but not that great. So um, that's why I really like asking that question. Interesting. Lisa? So this is one that I picked up from um, some screener questions that we used to ask on um, reference calls, but are you a firefighter or a fire marshal? So do you like, when there's a crisis, do you rush in and save the day? Is that your, is that your happy place? Or do you like to set up rules and structures that prevent fires from happening? There's no wrong answer here. It's just kind of an insight into how they like to work and how they like to problem solve. And then when I'm interviewing, my favorite question to ask is, um, what's your favorite part about working for this company? And I want to hear stuff about like that they love their coworkers and that they're excited to come to work and they love the stuff that they're working on. And that lets me know that that like it, it typically will catch people off guard. And um, you can kind of you can also say like, you know, why did you why did you join this company? Why did you come and work here? What is it about the company that attracted you? So you can get some insight as to how they're feeling and get a little ground level um, insight. But I think the the questions to which there are no wrong answers are kind of my favorite because it just gives you a little insight to the person. I'm not trying to trip anybody up. I really just want to hear about what their thought process is. That's a really interesting twist you took on that, Lisa, like going from the other direction too. And I think it, there, there is a key there, which is you should be coming in with some questions of your own. And some of them Absolutely. can be these kind of pre canned generic questions and some of them should be much more tailored. And so uh, while there's like a number of different types of questions that I like to ask, the, the one that I, I would highlight here is I just ask, and it seems like a really simple question, why Shopify? Yep. And mm -hmm. I think this really gets to that, that idea of, have you done your research? Do you have a reason that you wanna come work for us? Are you looking for a job or are you looking for a job with us? If you're looking for a job with us, what is it that stands out? And so I get two pieces of information here. I get information about how much research and excitement you have around the role. I also get information from the market, which you're part of the, the market of people where I would, you know, in marketing too, to, to try and find uh, potential employees um, about what's attractive um, in the company right now. And so I, I find that this is just a really seemingly trivial or simple question, but there's actually a lot of information that you can pull out of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, for the candidates, what do you think are good questions for candidates to ask during the interview? I kind of already tipped my hand on this one, but I like to hear about like what excites people. Why do they, why do they like coming to work for this company? What is it that makes their day good? Um, are there any um, things, is, is their impression of the company the same now as before they joined? That's kind of a like, it does what it says on the package sort of thing. Like I believe Zapier has very transparent values and I see them every day in what I do. And so I want to know from somebody who's at a company, like, is, is that the truth? Like is, is what you see um, as the public facing entity, is that really true? Or when you lift the lid, is there some, you know, other thing going on there? So I kind of want to hear about what is the, the real company that you're working for, not just the PR brochure. Yeah. My, my favorite questions are, uh, along the lines of this person has put a lot of thought into building software. Um, you know, there are some general principles that I think every company uh, that builds software goes through and some of the nuances are different. Uh, but, you know, someone may say, you know what, throughout my career, I've seen a struggle between, you know, product coming up with a vision and then the engineering team having trouble uh, implementing that vision, you know, how's that going at at Help Scout? Or, or here are things that I've seen work well in bridging in bridging that gap, right? Or does that resonate with you? Or something like, 
you know, uh, we, I, I, I'm used to this kind of CI, CD, and then, you know, usually uh, verifying the build is usually something that's very challenging. And so what I've seen happen to help solve that is this, and do you do that at Help Scout, right? So things like that, where this person has been in the trenches, they understand, you know, through <clears throat> daily first contact with new problems uh, in building software that they've thought about those problems and not just kind of solve them quickly. Uh, those questions really resonate that this person is really into crafting software and not just making commits to repositories. Yeah, I, I like both of those answers. That's uh, there's, there's a lot of good there. So again, you can think about this. There's it's kind of, if, if you're figuring out a strategy for interviewing, one of the strategies that you can take is you're going to speak with a number of people from the company. Um, so at Shopify, you're probably gonna speak with six to seven people. Um, during your interview process. So there are questions that you can ask to all of the people throughout the process. And then you can get back to uh, what uh, Anwan and Lisa had talked about earlier, I think both of you, uh, which is trying to pull out like what what's the truth about the company and what's consistent in what people tell you and where are the inconsistencies or maybe some areas that you can probe a little deeper to learn more. And by asking a similar question to everybody, you can actually see some of that come out. Um, the other part of this is really asking questions that speak to your interests, right? And again, the more homework you do about this, the more in depth you can get with your questions and the, the better information that you can get out. Because keep in mind, again, this is a two-way process and you're interviewing the company. So you want to understand the best that you can about that. So um, I've had good questions about compensation and benefits uh, where it's not surface level questions, but where people really like there is some nuance that they want to get into and understand uh, like what what is the benefit strategy that the company employs, right? Um, and that's quite different than tell me, give me a list of benefits, which we'll give you on a website because you can read that, right? Things around career development. How am I going to grow my career? What opportunities do I have? You know, what opportunities have you had, right? You being like asking the interviewer, um, those sorts of things as well, right? So uh, questions like that or around challenges as Lisa was uh, talking about earlier, those sorts of things I think are good questions that are sort of open-ended and see where the interviewer takes it. And then you can actually probe a little deeper and do a little reverse interviewing uh, of your own. Great questions. Um, given the current situation with the pandemic and everything, what's the number one piece of advice you would give to job, uh, job seekers right now? I yeah. think, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Arlen. Yeah, I mean, my, my number one piece of advice is simple. Rehearse, practice. Interviewing is a perishable skill. Most of us do it maybe once every couple of years. The people who you're talking to interview pretty often. And so do mock interviews, call up a friend, hop on a Zoom, say, hey, run through these questions, uh, rate me on how I answer, uh, post some tough questions, ask me a question I'm not expecting uh, by rehearsing, by practicing, by doing mock interviews, uh, you're, 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 you're increasing the, the you're increasing the chance that you're not going to torpedo your chances just because you just didn't practice enough, uh, but that you're just able to explain yourself well enough. And so, you know, don't let the skills of interviewing be the deal breaker between you and getting that job. And I would say just practice, rehearse. Uh, you will be surprised at how much more comfortable and relaxed you are if you rehearse. Um, I have a couple of answers here. One is apply for all the jobs, all the jobs that look interesting to you. Don't fall into the trap of thinking that you have to have 100% of the listed qualifications in order to even apply for the job. Worst case scenario, they say no or they don't answer. You're not out anything. Uh, women in particular um, and underrepresented groups tend to only apply for jobs when they feel like they have 100% of the listed qualifications. And if someone else applies and they only have 50%, well, they applied and they got seen where you didn't apply. So you have to be in there to, to do it. And then also, I feel like some crucial questions for interviewees going forward to the company are going to be around what was your company's response during pandemic times? What did you do to support your current employees? Were there layoffs? Were there salary reductions? Were there any sort of penalties for the people who were working for you? Were you able to continue business? What did you offer your customers um, to help out with the pandemic? And also, what sorts of things were you doing during the areas where we needed some action on social justice? Did you make any changes to your company? Did you examine your diversity policies? Did you take time off to learn? Did you give people the freedom and the space to express what they were going through? Those are really important things now that I think 
probably wouldn't have occurred to anybody to ask um, pre-pandemic times, but I think are really good indication of what the company's values are and whether or not they actually hold them or they just put them on their brochures. Yeah, I think that the biggest advice I would give here um, to pick something that's different uh, is actually the same advice I would give you in your career uh, and whether or not you're interviewing and looking for a new job or whether or not you have an existing job and that's to figure out what it is that you want. Mm -hmm. um, what is it that you want out of the position? What is it that you want of working for this company? Um, or if you're, you already have a job and you're looking for say a new opportunity within the company, what is it I wanna get out of that, that opportunity? If you're looking for a promotion, what is it that you think you wanna get out of getting the promotion? Right? Maybe this actually isn't what you want. And I think uh, anyone was talking about this earlier and really the, the idea of wanting to get something specific out of this, what are you in it for, right? And so as an interviewer or a hiring manager, if you know what you want, it will be far easier for me. Um, and I think we'll, we'll get into this at some point, uh, maybe a little more, but you know, this comes through in your resume, this comes through in the conversations that you have, uh, the less work that you have for me as an interviewer, the, the easier my time is gonna be. And really, if you know what you want, you're gonna be able to tailor everything that we do to your interests. Um, and that's true as a hiring manager, that's true as a manager, um, that's true as just someone else who's a champion for you as well, right? It's, it's not necessarily an easy thing, and I don't mean to say you have to know exactly, I want a position with this or that, but what, what is important to you? Maybe it is the compensation and benefits package because you've got people to take care of and the general engineering doesn't matter. Maybe you wanna work on product and not internal tools, and that's a big thing for you as well. Maybe you're, you have a specific technology that you wanna learn and develop, and learning that we're a Ruby on rail shop means that this is actually not the greatest opportunity for you, that's okay. Um, but the, the sooner you figure out those types of, and the answers to those types of questions, the more you're gonna be able to direct your effort because there really are a million companies that you could apply to. So to Lisa's point, apply to everything, but like set what your pool is based on you know your own characteristics and your own criteria. Yeah, definitely. Um... As a hiring manager, aside from problem solving and communication skills, are there any other essential skills you're looking for? Yeah, um, I have an answer, but I do want to piggyback on what Lisa and Lawrence have both said. Yeah, apply to all the things. That is so crucial. Um, you miss every shot that you never take. Okay. So shoot your shot, give it a go. The worst thing that you the worst thing that can happen is that you never hear from the company again, right? Which is not a bad thing, probably. So I apply to all the things. I, I really love that. Um, one thing that I look for as, it's not really a skill, but is this person curious, right? Is there mm -hmm. a curiosity uh, that comes through in the interview? And, you know, you can train for communication and problem solving and kind of get yourself up to at least a base level, but it's hard to fake curiosity. And that comes through in, in, in how they interact with me. Are they asking questions that I've never considered? Am I questioning my life decisions talking to this candidate? Because they're just so curious, right? And so just that's so awesome if I can see that. And, and, and when I see that coming through in the candidate, uh, that helps me see that, okay, no matter where I put this person, uh, they're going to drive to get to some greater truth. Uh, and, and, and I love seeing that. If, if I can riff on that first one, I have I have an example of the apply to everything for me. Um, so I, after I finished my first year of undergrad in computer science, uh, they had a posting up for teaching assistants. And I'm like, well, I'm gonna be a second year student. They're not gonna take me as a teaching assistant, right? But someone said, they're like, why don't you fill it out? It's not a long application. So I filled it out and expected not to hear anything or just to hear a no. And sure enough, like two weeks later, they're like, yeah, you're hired. Uh, we, we need lots of teaching assistants. We don't have enough. We have a huge class coming in the next year. And all of a sudden I was in second year and a teaching assistant, which ended up being a great experience. And I did not expect to get it, but I got it only because I applied and some of my friends kicked themselves for not applying. So uh, I think that that really is true. And uh, it's, it's far more true for you know anyone who's not sure that you meet all of the requirements. Um, let the other person tell you no. Like you, you don't need to say no for yourself. Um, so to, to answer this actual question, now that we're not talking about this actual question, um, you know, to, to riff on that, uh, so I think that there's, you know, uh, Anwen talked about curiosity and I think ability to learn fits in that. Um, communication skills also a big broad topic. And I think when people think communication skills, they often think my ability to write, my ability to talk. Mm -hmm. One of the biggest things that you can pull out that is in that bucket, but many people do not demonstrate is the ability to listen. 
And we see this all the time with people not following the directions, not following the cues that the interviewers are giving them. And this is like an automatic red flag, like when we get to the end of it, that this is a person who does not listen to other people. They weren't taking the cues, they were doing their own thing. And then we really have to see, was that consistent throughout all the interviews? But th this is something that comes up all the time. Um, really that ability to listen and really hear what other people are telling you. Um, and I think it does fit in the communication bucket, but I wanna call it out because I, I don't think that it's necessarily what people think of when they say communication skills. All right, so I have like a, a little part two about the uh, apply for all the things. Um, if it's a company that you're really interested in working for, don't take one either no response or a negative response and have that be the end of the story. If it's someplace that you really want to work, continue to follow them, look for more opportunities, gain more skills. You're not going to be the same person tomorrow that you are today, and that might fit better. We have um, in our retreat, we always have trivia. And this year, one of the questions was, how many times did you apply to Zapier before you were hired? And the company average is three. And there was someone at my table who had applied six times. I don't know that I have the 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 tenacity to apply to something six times and be rejected five of them, but they got in. So continue to pursue things that interest you, things that match your values, things that are places where you want to go. Not today, maybe tomorrow. So do that. And then the thing that I'm looking for, um, I, and it's kind of along the same lines as communication, but be able to tell me a story about the why of a question. I don't just want to hear a mechanical answer. I would like to hear some of you in that answer. Why did you choose this solution? What was it about it that worked for you? Was it the most expedient? Cool, because sometimes we have to do that. Was it the most challenging? Awesome, then you're up for new challenges. Like I kind of want to hear a little bit about why you chose the things you chose and the way you're answering the question. I want to hear that, the thing that's just below the surface. I don't want to just hear that one pat answer. Cool. I love that thank example, for, Lisa. It was, it was really yeah, great. Thank you it's, for the great insights. Yeah. Sure. You know, there, there, there's, there's something else that's in there that's a, you know, a, a rejection or if someone says no, all that means that there wasn't a match and a fit for this particular job with your particular okay. experience at this particular time. That's right today. Right. It doesn't mean that there will never be a match, um, but exactly. right now there wasn't a match. And so it's not a comment on you as a person. It's a comment on the current, like just right now, the match between you and this position. All right. Um, when you're interviewing someone and you get a resume, what are the first things that you will look for in this resume? Hmm. This is a really interesting question for me because I've, I've, I've done the resume screening part of it. And I had somebody ask me before they sent me a batch of resumes what I was looking for. And then they didn't do that. So like that was a person who wasn't listening. What I'm looking for is is not just a link to your GitHub repo. Um, I want to know what you learned from that project. Like, sure, give me the link, but like, what technology did you use? Why did you use it? What did you learn? That's what I care about. This is especially important for Code School grads because you don't have a wealth of experience. Tell me about the projects that you worked on, not just like we built an app to match pets with pet walkers. Like, I, I wanna know why. What tech stack did you use? Why do I care about it? What did you do? I want to hear a little bit about your previous experience in that same context. Like, what did you take from that job? Did you provide any value when you were there? Did you increase numbers somehow? Did you solve a problem? Every job is essentially a problem looking for a solution. So every job posting has within it some sort of problem that the company is trying to solve by hiring a human to do that. What can you bring to me that that reflects that? So don't have, I mean, you can definitely have one static resume, but make sure that when you are applying for a specific job that you're highlighting the things in your resume that are listed in the job description. Because frequently it is a keyword parser that's gonna get you in the door. So if you don't have any of the things that match the position I'm looking for, that's not gonna happen. So make sure that you're at least reading the job description well enough to know what are the things that they're gonna be looking for and make sure that you have those things either highlighted or at least included on your resume so that I know that they're a thing that you have experience with. I'll say that the first thing that I look for when I see a resume is how long is it? Mm. Um, so sometimes I get like six page resumes. Uh, 
I, I, I don't want to read six pages. Oh. Um, so two pages max for me. Uh, anything beyond two pages is automatically like I'm, I'm already lost interest. Um, within those two pages, I agree with what you said, Lisa. It's really you're trying to tell a story and you're trying to make this as easy for me as a hiring manager or a recruiter as possible, right? So don't just dump in a whole bunch of facts. Um, in general, don't tell me what the companies did. Uh, I see this a lot where there's like paragraph summaries of what the companies did. But what I want to know is what did you do? And to your point, Lisa, what did you learn? And what was the impact of the work that you did? Right. So it's much less interesting that I wrote code with Java. It's much more interesting that I built out this resilient you know, infrastructure that resulted in X number of improvement if you have that. Right. Something like that. So much more around the impact of the work, what, but really focused on what is it that you exactly did um, as opposed to what did the team do or what did the company do? Yeah, very much uh, uh, very, very much in line with what Lisa and Lawrence have been saying. I'm looking for the story. What's the story that you're telling? And you, and you have about 45 seconds to tell me the mm -hmm. story. So yeah, six pages is not a winning way to give me that story, but you know, not just to what Lawrence said, not just what the company did, but what was your your impact? Um, and if you can show me the evolution of your career, uh, maybe at one company you were a back end developer, and then you decided the next company to go more to the front end. Well, try to weave that story and why, and uh, and what were the outcomes? Right, not just this framework or or this language. It's really cool that you wrote React. It would be cooler if you led a project to make it easier for React developers at your company to work in your repository and that you reduce the time to create features by 30%, something like that, right? Having that numerical way to put bite to your outcomes, that's really powerful. I would say the thing to keep in mind, at least, that I give resume writers the advice of all the time is think highway billboard not novel. I need to absorb that quickly as I drive by because as Anwan said, you've got maybe a minute of my attention as I'm screening resumes to grab me. So don't, don't, don't give me six pages. Yeah. And to that point, keep in mind what the purpose of your resume is. Like, what is it you want to get out of putting a resume yeah. together? Right. If you're putting a resume together, you want to get to talk to somebody. Like the point is to get to an interview. So you need to differentiate yourself enough. So when anyone's looking at this in 45 seconds, yours is gonna stand out enough and he's gonna say, yeah, I wanna talk to this person, right? That That's what you're after with a resume. Beyond that, you've gotta convince them by speaking. And I'm getting older, so can we do a little bit bigger than 9.5? <laughs> maybe, <laughs> maybe 11. En and no, no comic sand, by the way, just... yes. But like enough style so that I get a peek into your um, your your aesthetic, but like maybe don't give me that highly des overly designed like charts of your skills that don't really make any sense. Like sometimes words are better than pictures. I think you're saying don't use those on the online resume generation. Don't tool use those online resume like generation because then they end up, they all end up looking the same. I when that yeah. person asked me what they should send. It was for a, a group of code school grads. I ended up getting 15 identical, and I mean identical resumes, just the names were different and that was it. And I was like, maybe offer them the advice that they should each pick a different template if they're gonna use templates. Maybe they are not serving them well by all making them use the same one. So put a little, don't, don't, don't buy a template online. You can take some inspiration from them, but you, it's fine. What you're doing is great. And unless you're hiring, unless you're looking for a design job, maybe don't design your resume too much. Um, so I think in the interest of time, I will fast forward a little bit. Um, so I think um, someone in the audience is very interested at um, GitHub or portfolio uh, websites. Um, when candidates share their GitHub or portfolio websites, um, do you look at them? Like, and when you look at them, what are you looking for? Um, should they- Lisa, you're already shaking your head. <laughs> <laughs> no, Lisa, I'm not gonna go pawn through your GitHub repository. And, unless you've given me a reason to, I'm not gonna go pawn through your GitHub repository. I don't care. Like, I'm sure you did fine. I wanna know why and what you learned from this project. Why did you build this thing? And why do I care that you built this thing? Tell me that story. Otherwise I'm not, I'm, you know, if, if I've gotten your resume 
I'm not going to click on any links, really. I'm just going to read what you have there. And so if you can give me a snapshot of why this project mattered, that's way more important to me than that you have 17,000, you know, um, objects in your GitHub repo or you have all these commits. I don't, that, that doesn't impress me. Like, it, it's cool. And it makes a really cool chart with all the little green squares on it. But also, like, I, I care about why the tools that you used, why you chose them, what you got out of it, what you learned, those are the things that matter to me, not that you have them. So here you'll see a bit of a different of approach. I will click on the links in your profile if you put them in there. Um, <laughs> and it's maybe not for the reasons that you're thinking though. If you've listed a GitHub profile or you send that to me and I click through there and you have very few contributions, that's telling that like, why did you create this profile just to be mm. able to send it? Because you're not actually very active on GitHub. Um, in fact, one of the things that I do look for if you've provided one of these you know, community site profiles is how have you interacted with other people? Um, mm -hmm. And this is the kind of thing where you're probably not going to get hired based on your interactions uh, in, in a, a profile like this, but you will get rejected from the process if you've had very poor interactions with other people um, in, these, in these places. Yeah, I have some sensitivity here because I've always worked at places that had proprietary code bases. So my GitHub repo is, is like, I have a few, a handful of personal projects, but the majority of my work is behind vaulted doors that no one can see. So like, I, I don't, I don't look down on somebody who doesn't have a ton of stuff in their GitHub repo because I know how that feels. But also like, <clears throat> if you got it, you're right. It has to be substantive. It has, you have to, like, I, I would like to, for you to have interacted with other humans. What's more impressive to me than a singular GitHub repo is any contributions you've made to an open source project. That, that shows more to me about how you work with other humans rather than some awesome project that you built yourself, which is super cool, but also like I'm hiring you to work on a team, kind of want to see how you work on a team rather than your individual, you know, anybody could hack something out in a day that's, that's just theirs without having to deal with other humans. But did you have to run that past somebody else and have them approve or, or reject it? That's a thing I'd like to see. Yeah, just I mean, have, uh, oh, no, no, go. Yeah, I mean, GitHub repos, I, to me, they don't make or break your candidacy. Yeah. I think they're nice to have. I do, I am sensitive to the fact that you do have to have a certain amount of privilege to do that, right? You have to have the time outside of your day right. job to commit to, you know, this code base. And so I, I'm careful to not put too much weight, weight on them. Uh, but what's really impressive is if, you know, there's some mission-driven uh, GitHub repo that you, that shows your passion. So a friend of mine named Tiffany uh, Bell, she's Tiffany with the I on, on Twitter, uh, made the human utility, which is, I think it's closed source, but uh, it's to pay water bills for people who don't have access to clean water, right? Like, like, like in Flint, Michigan, right? Wow. So if you're doing something like that, that shows me a lot. And the fact that you're contributing to code that's, that's mission driven tells me a lot about you. So something like that uh, would be a nice check uh, in what I used to assess do I want to move forward with you? So from that perspective, much much more about your interests than about the fact that it's on GitHub or like a coding site at all. Like that that could be you know your involvement in a charity or you know some other um, event that you've put on or something. Uh, it really doesn't have to be code related in that respect. Yep. Absolutely. Makes sense. <clears throat> um, I guess this is more of a question for Lawrence. Um, prior to the pandemic. A portion of Shopify's engineering team actually worked from an office. How was the transition to all remote? Yeah, so my, my team um, was fairly distributed, although I worked out of an office and I had probably a third to a half of my team was working in an office setting. And so I think there's two pieces to this and I, I'm not the first one to talk about this. There's working from home and then there's working from home during a pandemic. And so yes. we, we have called this out explicitly. Um, functionally, from a systems perspective, Shopify made the decision long ago to use systems that are all accessible over the public internet. So from that perspective, it, we didn't have to get set up at home from you know, our infrastructure perspective, but we did need people to get set up at home in terms of setting up a home office, creating a space to work, and figuring out how they were going to work with the new constraints that they had on them. We have lots of people who, have, who are caregivers, either for their children or their parents, um, people who have roommates, people who are living in isolation, all of these cases are quite different, even in the same category. And so that's been the real challenge for us is, is finding out what that is um, and how to deal with it. As a company, I think that we've approached this really well. And it's something I'm quite proud of uh, as like a senior leadership team that we've been able to do this. And that's to work with the individuals on our team and create structure that works for them. 
For many people, this has resulted in reduced work hours. It's resulted in non-standard schedules. So some people are on two hours, off two hours, and then again, on two hours, off two hours, so that they can swap out with their partner who's also got responsibilities at home, uh, or doing things like putting more of the communication asynchronously because I'm sharing a space, a small space with someone else. And so being in meetings all day long, or even just the fact of trying to be in video meetings all day long can be very draining. Um, I think that we're, we're approaching kind of the breaking point for the flip side of this, which is people who really love being in an office setting, love being around other people are really finding, you know, being distanced to be a challenge. And that's something where I don't have a solution for that uh, with the current state of the world, but it's something that I'm quite aware of and, you know, building connection and allowing for some sort of interaction, even though we're not doing in-person interaction has been a real challenge. So um, again, I think the company pivoted quite well into a remote work environment. I think that we've been very uh, quick to make decisions around this and set people up for success the best that we can in this type of environment. Uh, we at Shopify are looking at the long term. So we've, we've announced that we're a digital by default, uh, which you can think of as remote first company. Um, so we're following the, the leads of my two uh, panelists here. And uh, this, this is a, an announcement that we've made and now we're figuring out how to do that. But the acknowledgement is that what we're doing right now is not the best version of work from home and that this will get better over time. And we're designing for that future as well. Lisa and Juan, any comments about working from home and working from home during a pandemic? Uh, I think very much like what Lawrence said, we're helping people adjust to having additional demands on their schedule. Um, folks with small children have had to transition to being uh, homeschooling. Uh, that's a whole new, um, it's a whole new adventure and it's not an easy transition for them. So my message to my team was take care of yourself and your family first, set up the structures that you need, let us know what we can do for you, work the hours that make the most sense for you. We have the luxury of this flexible scheduling and because we're a global enterprise, somebody's online 24 hours a day, you wanna work at two in the morning your time because that feels good, great. But also set limits for yourself. Make sure that at this point you're not always working because it's super easy when there's nothing else going on with the pandemic to just throw yourself into work and work too many hours. We've seen some productivity spikes that we're not super excited about because it means people are working too many hours. So we're trying to moderate that. But also like not everybody's into Animal Crossing. So you know, you gotta have something to do. Whatever works for you to have some downtime is really important to us. And I've been you know, as sensitive as I can to my team's needs, whatever time they need to handle their stuff has been my priority. Yeah, I would say working at HelpScout has been fantastic because we were built to be a remote company. If you've been thrust into working from home, uh, it's easy to make that feel like living at work, right? Which is not the best experience. And not only that, but you are also working with probably a spouse who's working from home and there's kids who you had to help them with their homework. So this is not really the best working remotely experience. So I hope it doesn't sour folks on that. But to Absolutely. what Lisa said, do what you can. Hopefully you have a very strong supportive team at the leadership level who is being kind, compassionate, and patient. Uh, this is not normal. There are things happening right now that are not normal. And so you should not beat yourself up for not being how you normally feel. Uh, so I would say do your best, lean on each other, and trust your leadership to, uh, to give you some space during this difficult time. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing all these interesting insights about you know your team's hiring processes. I loved all the interview questions that you guys shared. See you all later. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Bye. Thank you. Bye.